Chat. Hello, good afternoon to our on-site guests. Welcome to our event. We would like to request everyone to please move a bit forward because we are expecting more guests uh, in just a while. And welcome once again to our event, Magic and Hero Stories of the Anti-Spanish Revolution here in the Visayas as well as the celebration of the 124th year of the Cebu Revolution victory against Spain.
Welcome to Magic and Heroes, stories of the anti-Spanish revolution here in the Visayas, as well as the celebration of the 124th year of the Cebu Revolution victory against Spain. May we request everyone to please stand for our opening prayer. Pagampu alang sa nagbagong sugbo. O mabubuhat, nagampu kami kanimo alang sa usa ka sugbong hingpit nga nabag-o. Ang sugbo nga sa mga bayani gidamgo usa ka sugbo nga atong ika pasigarbo. Kami nagaampu alang sa bagong sugbo, sugbo anong maalamon sa among mga kaagi nahiusang nagpanday pagkat pagkabot sa damgo sa sugbong maisog mauswagon og gawas nun. among mga pangandoy para sa matag bata may pagkaon sa lamisa ug balay makatulgan may bisting makahupay sa gabii nga matugnaw giatiman gipangga sa tibuok katilingban kami Nagaampo, alang sa bagong sugbo. Sugbo anong dakugarbo sa among mga kaagi. Naiusang nagpanday, pagkabot sa damgo, sa sugbong maisog, mauswagon, o gawas nun. Amen. Please remain standing for the singing of the Philippine National Anthem. Performed by the Hunkera Street Children's Choir. We Cebuanos aspire to be worthy in following the path taken by our heroes in their fearless fight for a land whose sun and stars forever shine for justice, whose loving embrace is everyone's paradise. We strive to become a people who love our motherland in our every breath and with every drop of our blood, sweat, and tears. You may now take your seats. To our on-site and online guests, welcome to another FB Live exclusive brought to us by Palm Grass, the Cebu Heritage Hotel. And today we are having this very important and magnificent event, which is the Magic and the hero stories of the anti-Spanish revolution in the Visayas, as well as the celebration of the 124th year of the Cebu Revolution victory against Spain. My name is Josh, and I will be with you throughout this entire event. Once again, welcome. And today, we recall two very important dates, guys. Okay? So we have... Uh, December 24, 1898, that is when the Cebu Cateponeros raised the Philippine flag at Fort San Pedro while the Spaniards left on their gunboats. And today, December 29, 
uh, that is on 1898, a Thanksgiving Mass was held for the victory of the Cebu Revolution and celebrated at the Cebu Cathedral. So, to everyone, hello. Uh, maayong hapon, mangadang hapon, and good afternoon to everyone. For those who are watching us online, hello to all. And you can feel free to uh, just uh, share our link. Feel free to share, like our page, of course. And feel free to comment later on uh, once we go to our uh, important talks. Okay? And with us uh, this afternoon on our on-site guests, uh, we have here the Cebu Association of Tour Guides. Let's give them all a big round of applause. Hello. And earlier, we saw the uh, uh, Da Street Children's Choir performing. And with them was Koya Ferdi holding the Philippine flag. And... Oh, before I forget, uh, feel free to greet everyone here at our on-site guests. Feel free to greet the person in front of you, beside you, behind you. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Yes, and Merry Christmas and Happy New Year as well to all our online viewers. So we have a lot of things in store for today, guys. But before that, we have to recognize also our event partners. okay? Because we're not just doing a talk. This is something historical as well. And we'd like to thank and recognize the USC, University of San Carlos Center for Social Research and Education. Museo Sugbo, the Central Visayas Association of Museums. Uh, Biyande, Heritage Center and the SOAN 2020 in core. Of course, aside from our partners, we have participants as well. From Luzon, we have the Schools Division of Taguig City and Pateros, as well as the City College of San Jose del Monte, the Department of Education, Paco Manila, and PUP. In the Visayas, we have the Samar National School as well as our friends there in Mindanao as well. So, yes, uh, this is something uh, interesting as well because tomorrow we we'll also be celebrating uh, Rizal Day. Okay, and uh, it's a holiday, if I'm not mistaken. So, it's a holiday. So, taas taas sa tong holiday. We'll have a long holiday tomorrow because we'll be celebrating New Year in the weekend as well. Okay, so yes, as mentioned, we have celebrations. We already celebrated Christmas, but of course, as Christians, taas taas niya to ang celebration for Christmas. Maabot pani, we'll be going through January for us. It's just the beginning of Christmas. Then, aside from that, we have the Pasco sa Kagawasan and Rizalde, as mentioned earlier. And the this one, hmm, this one is called Tagbo 2023. It is Palm Grass Hotel's New Year's celebration. And if I'm not mistaken, we'll be doing this one FB Live as well. Okay, so for today's event, let me just run through uh, some of the things we'll be doing tonight. We'll, of course, we'll be having conversations with, the, with our historian, Dr. Earl Jude Cleope from Suleiman University and uh, the Commissioner of National... The Historical Commission of the Philippines and performances coming from the Conquera Street Children's Choir and a tribute from the 18 from 1898 Mangugubot Sasugbo descendants. Nice. And uh, I'm sure you're a bit excited of our event for today, but I have to also promote some of the events coming up because here at Palm Grass. Uh, we don't just do this for entertainment. We want to educate everyone. We want to inform everyone of our heritage, our history. Yes. And upcoming events we have on January 12, that's 2023, we have the, the Santo Nino versus Mga Diwata retracing the Sinulog roots. And of course, we have our guest panelists on that time, Dr. George Emmanuel Borinaga. And on that day also, we'll have the guest Dato Amay Yi Iwag Lin Linsahay 
from Bukidnon. So we'll be here on January uh, 12. And in a while, okay, so at this point, we can have uh, one more song performance this time. This time, this is an original song about Christmas and Cebu independence from Spain. Uh, these are written by none other than Miss uh, A. Miss A. Ag Agrippina Givelondo, music by LG Fuentes, and performing for us here back on stage will be this Honkera Street Children's Choir. We also have to recognize also their vocal coaches, JB and Neil. So guys, before we proceed with our performances, uh, if you wish to repost, retweet, share our uh, event right now through Facebook or through different social media platforms. Don't forget to put the hashtag Cebu Independence and Magic and Heroes. All right. Ready na mo, kids? Okay, ready na sila. Okay, so let us give a big round of applause to the Honkera Street Children's Choir for their performance. A big round of applause.
All right, another big round of applause to our kids from Hongkera Street Children's Choir. Once again, the song Pasco sa Kagawasan is an original song about Christmas and Cebu independence from Spain in 1898. Another big round of applause to our kids. Once again, guys, don't forget to put our hashtag for uh, if you want to share our event for today. That's Cebu Independence and hashtag uh, Magic and Heroes. All right. So, yeah. So I mentioned Magic and Heroes, and uh, we'll be sharing. Uh, we'll be hearing some some sharings later on. More info about this one. Okay, and uh, oh, by the way, before we forget, once again, Merry Christmas to all and a Happy New Year in advance. I'm hoping you enjoyed your Christmas break or you continue to enjoy your Christmas break, especially our students who are watching for us working. But lang. We are trying our best as well to have fun. Now, um, we will now proceed to our... Uh, program proper, our talk, and I turn you over to none other than the lovely Miss A, Ma'am Ma Agrippina Givilonda. A big round of applause. Thank you to our MC. Thank you for that lovely introduction. So our MC this afternoon in our, this very important event celebrating the 124th year of, of Cebu independence from Spain is Jos Andrino, a multi-talented um, uh, teacher of the University of San Jose Recoleta. So we're so happy that he is with us this afternoon and uh, moderating this event also. He is also a visual artist. And if you have seen him, uh, if you have seen that, um, painting depicting Raha Humabun, it was he who was the model. So it, he is a model also, a cosplayer also. So a round of applause for our moderator and MC this afternoon, Thank Josh. You, <laughs> Thank you, Miss A. <laughs> so, um, so this is a very important event. Today is a very important event. So you already know that we also celebrated last April 3, 1890, uh, last April 3 this year, also the anniversary of the Battle of Tres de Abril. And Pamgras de Cebu Heritage Hotel had its also grand opening on April 3, 2017. So, and on April 3, 2016, when we had our um, soft opening, we launched the book Leon Quilat and the 1898 Cebu Revolution against Spain. And this is authored by Emil Hustimbaste. So for us at Pamgras, the very important events in our history, especially in Cebu history and Visayan history and the history of the Visayas, is, are always very important for us. So that's why every year also we celebrate the 1898 Cebu Revolution victory against Spain. Last year, even with Typhoon Udep, um, that, that hit Cebu and the rest of the islands in the Visayas and Mindanao. We, we still celebrated Pasco sa Kagawasan. And at that time, last year, December 29, this, uh, a year ago, even if we had only generator set, we celebrated, we commemorated this very important event with, with Tinabangay Alang sa Pasco sa Kagawasan where we launched a relief drive for our um, brothers and sisters, the survivors of the Typhoon Udet. And at that time also, we, we congratulated the staff at Pamgras for donating what could have been the budget for our Christmas party for the survivors of Typhoon Udet. So the Ghana Kaikung story. So, so this year, so we have celebrated again Pasco sa Gagawasan, a year before that, in 2020, during the pandemic, we had the Department of Education, superintendents, and the regional director come here for a Christmas party during the pandemic with um, Kalipay 
uh, kasadya sa Pasko, sa kagawasan. Also, the Honkera Street Children's Choir were able to perform during that time. So we also thank our our guests right now, the, the Cebu Association of Tour Guides. Thank you for coming. We also have our uh, representative from Katipun, the Katipunero, uh, uh, the, from the family of Katipunero, Don Gregorio Abellana. We have Noel Crucio. Thank you for coming. We also have the Kulturang Sigbuanon and the Bagong Chatro Honkera. Dagang salamat to the youth uh, of Cebu who are celebrating this very important event in our history with us. So dagang salamat to the Honkera Street Children's Choir. We're so happy with the children of Honkera Street who are developing their talents with the help of their voice coaches, Neil and JB. So we would be recording soon their song on Pasco sa Kagawasa. And hopefully next year, we will have a music video with the children of Honkera Street uh, regard, uh, with that song, Pasco sa Kagawasan. Uh, and also, uh, we, are, we are proud also of the arranger of that song, a uh, Gen Z musician, LG Fuente. Thank you very much. So this today, we are so happy. It is our, our honor and our pleasure to have with us this afternoon a historian who will be sharing with us the magic and the heroes in the Visayas um, that, that joined or that led the revolts against the Spanish colonial rule. We would not be celebrating this important day today, the Cebu independence from Spain, without these heroes, without these, uh, these leaders of the revolt who were in the past, they were called as bandits or they were called as just, um, I don't know, maybe they were called um, um, mga mangingilad or something. So they were not honored in the past. So right today, we honor these heroes, these leaders of revolts that led the, 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 these revolts that were the precursor of the 1896 Philippine Revolution and also the 1898 Revolution in the Visayas. So in the different parts of the Visayas in 1898, the, the Visayans won against the Spanish forces. In November of 1898, in Cinco de Noviembre, the Negros people defeated Sp the Spanish forces in, in Negros. And also uh, in Bohol on December 25, they established their own revolutionary government. And of course, a day before that, on December 24, Cebu was finally free from Span the Spanish colonial rule. Cebu the Cebuanos were able to fly the Philippine flag at Fort San Pedro, the bastion of the control of the Spanish colonial rule. So they left, the, the Spaniards left Cebu aboard their gunboats. They themselves ripped, they tore their own Spanish flag as they went uh, uh, aboard their gunboats. So today, so Karun, nagdita maglagan kay daghana kay kong storya. I thank you also the I to our online audience the the uh, from the uh, the DepEd Tagig City and Pateros also to those who are watching us at the National Quincentennial Committee page Maria Cecilia I hope we already have audio right now to City MG this is not Basconilio ni dili ni si Maria Cecilia Cabanyes <laughs> Basconcilio so, and we have Raul Buzon, uh, our heritage advocate, Arsili Alfaro, Lyndon Johnson, and Janet Diego. Daghang salamat for joining and for the apartisyo. And thank you also to our flag bearer who is on Katipunan uniform, Ferdinand Ascaraga. He also actually created my replica of pre-colonial earrings. Uh, this is the Patanao earrings available at Palm Girls, the Cebu Heritage Hotel. So, our, our resource person this afternoon is currently working on a book on Paritime History of the Visayas. And, and uh, he also studies, he is studying about the Japanese occupation in Negros Island. He is 
a member of the board of the Philippine Studies Association Incorporated, and he is also a board member of the Philippine National Historical Society, and uh, he is an institutional sustainability assessor of the Commission on Higher Education. He is a uh, technical working group member of the Cultural Mapping Project and former head of the National Committee on Historical Research of the National Commission for Culture and the Arts. He is right now a commissioner of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines and he is currently the Vice President for Academic Affairs of the Siliman University in Dumaguete City. It is our honor and our pleasure to introduce to you our resource person this afternoon, Dr. Earl Jude Cleope. So, uh, maayong hapon, Dr. Earl. Maayong hapon sa tanan sa on-site o sa online audience. So, we would put the name of Dr. Earl on his camera. So, uh, we thank uh, Dr. Earl for being here really on-site in celebrating with us this very important event, the 124th year, the 124th anniversary of the Cebu, of Cebu independence against Spain. So, um, Dr. Earl, um, so you have studied much about um, these revolts that were the precursor of the 1896 National Revolution. Please describe to us this, how these independent nativistic religious revolts became uh, the precursor to the 1896 National Revolution. And please give examples of these revolts in the Visayas. Okay. Um, una sa tanan, uh, I'm thankful for the invitation and uh, Maying hapon, greeting you your 124th celebration of the victory of the Cebuanos in the Philippine Revolution. Um, these movements uh, we call early revolts were actually all over the Philippines. So it was not only in the Visayas. In fact, in Luzon, you have the Coloro movement uh, in the area of Batangas and uh, Tayabas or Quezon provinces. And then you also have the Guardia de Honor revolt in Pangasinan and the Ilocos provinces. In the Visayas, it started early, as early as 1620. In the early parts, decades of the 1600s, the revolts already were rocking in Limasawa. There was already a Bangkau revolt. Uh, Bangkau is the chieftain of Limasawa who revolted. And <clears throat> similar revolts also erupted in Bohol with the Tamblot revolt. And then, of course, in the island of Panay, you have all semblances of the revolt. Now, these are what we call revolts characterized by a sprinkling of religious, uh, nativistic, protest movements, and these usually were headed by religious and political figures. In Negros, a similar revolt happened with the Babaylans, I will discuss later. And then in Samar and Leyte, you have the Pulahanes and the Dios Dios and the Babaylan movement. So if you notice, all over the Visayas region, there were early revolts already as early as the 17th century. And these revolts found adherents later on with subsequent formations of revolutionary movements. And we can see this echoing all over the islands that really led, especially in Cebu, with a leader who came from Negros, but with a nom de guerre kilat. And that's why you have this magic, enchantment, fascination with heroes. And so that's the main thread of our topic this uh, afternoon. So I think uh, that, that probably sums up everything on these early revolts. This can be religious. These can be nativistic. This can be in a form of protest and peasant movements 
but it has all the elements of the sprinkling of what we call as precursors to what a general movement that happened, the Philippine Revolution. So as I've said, to make this clear, these were all labeled as early revolts, just simply revolts because they were not coordinated. There, were, there was no unity. It sprung, came out from different islands, but then again, it, it became a unified version towards the end of the 19th century. Thank you, Ma'am Agrippina. Thank you, Dr. Earl. So we're, we're so happy to know that um, Visayan, Cebuanos are actually, do not, they, they really do not want to become oppressed. So they really fight against oppression, and we have seen that in the examples of Dr. Earl. So uh, right now, we would like to have a, our, um, our um, representative from the <clears throat> Gregorio Abellana family for, their, for it. So we will have uh, Noel Crucio, the representative of the <clears throat> Catiponero, uh, Catiponero, um, Catiponero Don Gregorio Abellana for <clears throat> his tribute to <clears throat> their ancestor. So, uh, salamat, uh, Miss A. Okay, now. Thank you for inviting me here, uh, representing the Abeliana, um, Katiponero, Don Gregorio Abeliana. Uh, my wife is an Abeliana, so that's why I'm here. Um, Kaninga Kanta is it's called Niining Adlawa. This is a song by Oli Castor and Carl Gaspar. And the song talks about sacrifice, commitment, and principles. Uh, yeah. Okay. Na. Kanunay nga manggihatago Kinabuhi gipatumaw Sa matagbinhi sa humay Bisan sa yuta ilubong Mutubo sa Inanay 
ni ining adlaw si Kristo makiglambi dihasa ka sing ka sing gumang milambo milungtad sa krus sa pagpakigbisug idupa kamut nga halad ug sabin hinga kita nom ibisbis ang dugo sa paglaum ug kining adlawa ang simbolo sa tanang adlaw nga kauban sa katilingban nga nagapanaw kini usa kalakang padulong sa panganduy nga nagahula mauy baruganan bisan diha sa kamatayon makigharong sa kamatayon ni ining adlawa ni ining adlawa ni ining adlaw Ngayon salamat. Okay. Hot. Daghang salamat uh, to Noel. Uh, Noel, we would like to ask you regarding that song. To, uh, so, he, Noel, who is uh, representing the Katipunero, the Gregorio Abellanas family, sang a song for those who are not Cebuano entitled Ni Ining at Lawa or This Day, a beautiful, moving, and inspiring song. And you would like Noel to, to explain to us the meaning yeah. of that song and who composed that song. Uh, the composer was Oli Castor and Ga Carl Gaspar, my friends in the, in the 80s, no? uh, from the Redemptorist community. Uh, it's a song about uh, commitment. It's actually a song of... Uh, uh, sacrifice for life, actually. So even if yeah, it's a song of commitment, sacrifice, service to to uh, the underprivileged, to the marginalized sector during that time. So I, I think it's uh, it's uh, it's relevant in our uh, topic or theme uh, this afternoon. So thank you, Salamat Noel. So it's a song about serving. Uh, the poor, the marginalized. So the, that song is um, very relevant until today. So that's why even our uh, Honkera Street children sings about our the, the children, the families who still need freedom from want, freedom from poverty until today. So the challenge of this day, it is Independence Day. We became free from Spain, but until today, our people are still not free from poverty. And this is the challenge for every one of us to continue living what our heroes struggled and died for. So, so we have discussed a while ago regarding the revolts that led to the National Revolution of 1896. And in Cebu, it is the 1898 Cebu Revolution. Also, we have, as we said, we have this these books also by um, also pam published by Palmgrass, the Cebu Heritage Hotel. Um, a short history of Cebu from the 1500s to 1890s. 
and the anti-Spanish revolution in Cebu. So this also mentions the Dagami revolt in Cebu. That was the first revolt um, in that's Kanusagani and Dagami revolt. Do you know? Do you remember when was the Dagami revolt in Cebu? Hello. Asa naman to atong mga koan? Mga... When was the Dagami? Maybe our audience online would be able to know. When was the Dagami revolt in Cebu? Did you know? I was Google pa mo. So, so when the, the Spaniards came to Cebu, occupied Cebu on April, they occupied Cebu on April 27, 1565 uh, with Miguel Lopez de Legazpi. Warrior Dagami. Led, a re led in ambush against the troops of Miguel Lopez de Legazpi on what date? On May 23, 1565, barely a month up, uh, when, upon the arrival or the occupation of Spain in our island. So he was killed two years after on Janu in January 1567. So they had these um, many act acts of defiance against Spain. So what did they do? They poisoned the Spaniards. So also, of course, um, uh, Tupas also led these um, uh, actions against Spain, the Spanish forces. So anyway, so we had revolts and also discussed by Dr. Earl uh, Cleope a while ago. There were revolts in the different parts of the Visayas in Bohol by Tamblot. Um, Bangkau Rebellion, ba Bangkau Revolt in, in Leyte, and um, also in, in Panay and other parts of the Visayas. So right now, we would like to, uh, our resource person, Dr. Earl Yope, a commissioner of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, also the vice president for academic affairs of Siliman University, to discuss with us, to elaborate. The, uh, more to elaborate more on these peasant protest movements in the Visayas that became part of the struggle against the Spanish colonial rule. Uh, thank you. Um, basically, the economic development of the whole of the Visayas led to dislocation. And that's the premise. Um, Panay, especially in the Ilo, and uh, Cebu, there was actually a boom. And this led to a lot of lands were converted to big agricultural lands that started with the encomienda system and then later the Ascenda system. Somehow, titles, torrent titles, were given to families. And that also dislocated a lot of simple folks who didn't have the title but they occupied the land and so there there were really a lot of dislocations now this dislocations led to the movement of a lot of people towards the hinterlands and this is now the problem when they went into the hinterlands some people had the aura the charisma to organize these people that culminated even with celebrations of dancing and cockfighting. And in, in, in any part of the Visayas, there is what we call as the Maayong Laki. And this Maayong Laki syndrome led to the growth of what we call as an organized group of peasants trying to bring about a satisfying culture that they used to have before the coming of the Spaniards. And usually, there were because of the economic dislocation, you now have guys who are saying that we should not pay taxes. We should stop paying taxes. These people are giving us a lot of tributes in all forms, especially the economic introductions of Spain. Tributes, taxes, all forms. And then... Of course, this was associated also with magic. Something that has been associated with what we call as the practice of folk Christianity. This led to the development and evolution of 
what we call as the introduction of anting anting, which you have there as a sample. Even such uh, Latin words as easy cream for sale here. That's a joke. You know that it's ice cream for sale here. Or eliki to iat miat. I like to eat meat. But there are incantations that, uh, that were associated with these protest movements. Um, call it nativistic, but when it gives people hope of a new future under a very, very disconcerting and very, very bad conditions, especially for them, especially among the ignorance, if we call them the ignorance, then it's very easy for them to align to this cause. And in all of the Visayas, you have this. As I've said, you, this was associated with the Pulahanes in Samar. Samar and Leyte provinces. This was associated with the Baybaylanis Tamblot Revolt in Bohol. In Panay, all over the provinces of Panay, there were vestiges of peasant movements associated also with for, for Christianity. But these were all peasant concerns. In Negros, I will elaborate later, a seldom mentioned event that actually is classified by anthropologists as similar to the Pulahanes, similar to the Guardia de Honor, and similar to the Coloro movement of Luzon, the big mass movement of about 20,000 people, the Buhawi movement that started in Negros. And then, of course, a carryover of the Buhami movement in the Occidental side was the very popular Papa issue, the Papa issue revolt that also culminated to that. And then, of course, this Buhawi stigma in Negros, for example, led to the propagation of another second Buhawi, this time during the Philippine Revolution. And then in the 1979, the Salvatore movement, and then in 1980, the Dios Amahan movement. And if you notice, in these forms of movements, in peasant forms, somehow the layer or the areas and the territories which this movement sprung up or originated are still the hotbed of insurgency in many parts of the Visayas. Which, uh, so I'd like to end at this point. Thank you. Salamat, uh, Dr. Earl. So I'm just, we're, uh, we would like to know, uh, we would like our audience online to know that we would be reading your comments as we go along and also your questions, but we will have a separate also open forum for the audience on site later for your questions after our conversations. So we would, I am just curious regarding those peasant um, the peasant unrest or the peasant movements. Because here in Junicius's book, like in the early part of the, of the Spanish occupation in Cebu, because it, before the Spaniards came, lands in our islands were not privately owned. They were communal or semi-communal in other parts. So the Spaniards started to privatize the land. Like they would ask, the dato or those the principales the principalia to treat the land as their own and they would buy it from the dato or the noble families so like in talisay for example the natives so the alinos are from talisay and other heroes in the 1898 cebu revolution they actually beheaded and they killed some friars and the 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 peasant unrest in Talisay continued until the 1898 and it started in the early Spanish occupation the issue of land being privatized so we would like to ask Dr. Earl regarding the picture also of the peasant unrest their issues aside from is it only tax or what are the other peasant issues of uh, of those in the other parts of the Visayas yeah it's really this economic dislocation that uh, was the main issue, especially on land ownership. Why? Because of the introduction of plantations, especially when the sugar industry had a boom in 1850. And this boom, you know, 
shifted from Panay to Negros. And there, there was really that problem. And uh, these peasant movements is similar also with what happened in Leyte and what happened in Samar uh, with the issuance of what we now call as Titulo. With the issuance of Titulo and with the elite saying that hangtud maabot sa akong mata until the area that you know is rich by the, my vision is mine. I think you've heard of that. That land is mine. And then forgetting that there were already traditional people who were already involved in farming. Uh, the, the worst part will be when, when corporations now, compa Compania, or we call Compania de Seguros, will also plant cash crop, especially sugar. And that's why if you notice, if you notice, um, aside from being called peasant revolts, these are also called millenarian movements because, as I've said earlier, the elements of Christianity for Christianity and religion, and of course, the nativistic beliefs in pre-Hispanic things were now added into the picture. So that, that became a very, what we call it, a very dangerous mix. Uh, of movements that really rocked, as I've said, it, the rocked the whole Visayas vision. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Earl. I'm also very curious about that word, ma ma maayong laki or naay kalaki. So for those who are not Visayans, maayong laki, so na pag translate ang maayong laki? <laughs> so if it's roughly, Ex it's literal translation. Person. Extraordinary person, but lucky in Visayas is a man. And maayong lucky or naay kalaki, someone who can do magic. But literal translation of that is a man who can do magic. Maayong lucky. But I would like, we would like to recall that before the Spaniards came, those who can do magic were the women and the feminized men or the gays. The Babaylanes, the religious leaders, were only women and, and um, the men who dressed as women. So how come that the, maayong, the one who can do magic is now called Maayong Laki or the, it, it now the religious leaders now became men instead of women? What do you think, uh, Dr. Earl? What could be the reason of that? In Panay, there were... There were there were women leaders in these early revolts, Rosario Kadaidai and the others. But uh, since, since most of the leaders, especially in the other islands, were Cabezas, they were former Cabeza de Barangays. In other words, they were heads of Barangay who turned. And then, like for example, um, Bangkau had Pagali as a partner, as a Babaylan. Uh, Tamblot also had his own Babaylan circle. But he was the military, he was the political leader. As I've said, uh, these are uh, ingredients of a lot of things, but the main cause was still dislocation and economic, uh, economic uh, we call that economic uh, introductions of economic policies that really caught uh, a lot of the science of God. So um, would that mean that um, because, of course, the Catholic religion introduced priests like um, the leaders of religion, would, of the religion, or those who would perform um, religious rituals are now men? So is it part of the folk Christianity? Like they would, um, is it still the, would they still go back to the, the was their struggle still to go back to the old religion or, or they now mix Catholicism with their own native religion? Um, actually, there was a pay. I, I forgot the author, but this is a very sensitive topic on why maybe this will be a good theory to put forward. One of the main reasons why men became leaders of the early revolt, especially in the early part, was the prohibition and in 
you know, in considering them as evil, satanic, of all sexual paraphernalias. Uh, penis rings were outlawed. Goat's eye. You know, all these were immediately outlawed, but these were used by for Hispanic, especially among the Visayans. Automatic. Why did why did Tamblot uh, make make a revolt or bankau? Because they were not allowed to have five or six wives. That's not allowed. So you notice that most of these chieftains had their own world. That's why it's millenarian. And so as a protest, you know what I mean. <laughs> and this became part of the equation. But of course, there were other. So probably yeah. that's that's um there is a very nice paper. I forgot the author, but it was a very convincing thing. And men, women, you know how it is when your usual routine, your your what you already consider as part of your culture will suddenly be labeled as demonic, satanic. Even the bulitas became symbols of evil practices. And that was not easy for the, the chiefs, the male and the female included. So this is very exciting, Dr. Earl. It's the first time that we know that there were actually sex Sexual revolts already in 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 early in the early Spanish occupation, and we would like you to know that we have a showcase there at the at our Galleria Independencia of the penis pins and penis rings replica by Ferdinand Ascaraga. We showed that in our red room last gabi sa kabilin. And of course, as according to Dr. Earl, those that give pleasure to women. Like the women demanded these gadgets from the men. They wouldn't have any sex relations with men if they do not have these rings and pins. And of course, kanang, some, some, some uh, researchers said that this is because in Southeast Asia, this is common in Southeast Asia. The men in Southeast Asia always give... Um, the women have sovereignty in Southeast Asia in pre-colonial times. And the men really give much importance to the pleasure of women. So, of course, the Spaniards think women were second-class citizens. And, of course, the religious leaders, the women who were religious leaders were demons. The women were demonized. That's why in our discussion with, remember, with our discussion with um, Dr. Um, uh, the one with, about the witchcraft in Cebu, about um, with Dr. Dr. Danilo Hirona. He mentioned about this uh, document he found in the archives of Spain about a report by the Augustinians on the witchcraft, witches in Cebu, because a woman enchanted a, 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 a Spanish soldier, the two Spaniards, those who rejected her, <laughs> sex reasons also. Yeah. Um, uh, these are some of the things that were not really articulated probably because it's a taboo or it's not part of our culture. But if you really want to know more about this, this was thoroughly mentioned in Pigafetta's account. The moment he landed in Cebu, about 16 to 17 pages were dedicated to this. And then, of course, you have a lot of accounts in Blair and Robertson, and of course the seminal work of uh, Henry Scott, the Barangay, chapter seven, talks about all this. So maybe for our audience, uh, you can take a look at these documents to, to see for yourselves uh, how these were, uh, you know, how these things uh, were, you know, came into play. Yeah. So we have already. Uh... There is um there is a are uh, there are questions other uh, comments from our audience. Kim Lakar says good afternoon from Tagig City and Pateros. Ellen also watching from Negros, a tour guide from Flag, and Dana says um uh, uh, watching from Capitan Cardones Integrated School, and Marcelo Celis is asking, is there any religious revolt in Cebu? 
Then Marcelo also says Tamblot is also Aibabaylan. So yes. the question about religious revolt in Cebu. Yes, there were. There were. Uh, there were lots of religious revolts even. Uh, even if it started in Talisa in 1565, other re revolts uh, came later. Yes. So um, our next question for our prepared question for Dr. Earl is about the millenarian movement. So we would like to ask, what are these millenarian, millenarian movements? Why are they called millenarian in uh, millenarian movements in the Visayas? And why did this find fertile grounds in the hinterlands? Ganong naagid sa mga bukid in the mountains. Yeah. Um, millenarian movements. Uh, these millenarian movements actually, um, all of them are labeled as millenarian movements because of the belief of something that will deliver them from the present, the present oppression and injustice. Why in the hinterlands? Because people now will go to the hinterlands so that they can practice all their beliefs. And the authorities now will, were really hunting them. In fact, the idea of the Guardia Civil was introduced in Negros in 1879 by Governor General Claveria, the one who introduced to us the concept of apellidos. And even these movements in Negros and many parts of the Visayas were even called civil-civil. They're labeled as civil-civil because the followers also tried to follow the uniform of the Guardia Civil. And uh, they, they became so organized, and, but as I've said, because patrols now were sent in order to stop the movement in, in the organization, and that's the reason why they shifted to the hinterlands. And the, the interesting way is that these areas or the terrains that provided very good protection for all these movements, are still what we now call as the hotbed of insurgency, even up to now. And that's something that uh, I will say later in my concluding remarks. Uh, salamat, Dr. Earl. So uh, we invite you to those who online to already give your questions for Dr. Earl. And also, we would like to know more about this Jus Buhawi movement. <laughs> Um, how did it gather so many followers? Okay. In 1887, so it's still about nine years before the actual Philippine Revolution outbreak, uh, there was a man by the name of Ponciano Elopre. He's uh, in, in Sambuanguita, around 25 kilometers south of Dumaguete. He was a cabeza, a cabeza. But then, you know, Oppressions. He, he had this tax collector known as Manuel Bugarin, who really gave him a lot of problem. And because of that, he turned himself into what we call now as Amayong Lucky, a, a man luluas, the charisma effect. Um, I think some of you might remember Father Trupa of the ET. Remember the movement? He's also from he's also from Sambuangita. And in fact, he was inspired by this person. So the Maayong Lucky effect, he began talking about his ability to be invincible by bullets, to travel from one place to the other using not the lana but a handkerchief, which is actually Leon Kilat's also version, which we can connect. He was now talking to people not to pay tax. He was now raiding the towns. Because, as, as they say, they're the new government, they're the new movement. He was so feared that in all the listings and records of the priests and the authorities, even in the early visit of Worcester in 1888, there was a mention already of the Dios Buhawi movement. The statistic at that time was that he had around 5,000 to 10,000 followers. And they were roaming the mountains of Negros all over. So that was Ponciano Elopre. But later, in 1888, Good Friday, also similar to what happened to Leon Kilat, 
there was a skirmish and uh, he was killed. But yet and see, all his followers, when her, his body was brought to Sambuangita, had the same saying, he, it was not him, but it was a banana stalk. And uh, he had this movement that was really what we call as, it, it, it was so popular that there was even, he had lieutenants known as Jews Taligsik. There is also Kamalting. And even when he died, his wife, Flaviana, continued the movement even up to the American period. And uh, the significance of the Buhawi movement was that when he died, Papa Ishu, Papa Ishu of Himamaylan invited all the Buhawi. So it became a bigger group now. Papa Ishu's group, simply called Babaylans, and the Buhawi group. Buhawi because he is a whirlwind god. He can command thunder and lightning. He can even have rains. Because that's how the, how the people believed in his powers of magic, of his talisman. And uh, so th that was Buhawi, as we said, very popular. But the thing that endeared him to the masses was his teachings of nationhood. That they were teaching already of Philippines to be governed by Filipinos. Did he study? He was a cabeza di barangay. But he was even inspired by, by the teachings of Rizal. And so um, that was Jos Bohawe, and his real name is Elopre, Ponciano Elopre. But if you go to his area, it's still a hotbed for communism. And in many, many parts in the history of Negros up to now, there are certain commander Buhawi of the NPA movement. Even his nom de guerre is still being, <laughs> is still being uh, remembered. And even Filipe Taiko, the one who led the Katipuneros in their march to Dumaguete on November 24, 1898, also named himself the second Buhawi. So that's uh, Buhawi. So uh, thank you very much, Dr. Earl. We're so curious, why is it that our heroes, like those uh, who led revolts, always call themselves like the elements, like Buhawi. It's a cyclone, or is this a... What's, what's, what's a gani ng Buhawi in English? What am I, like whirlwind? Whirlwind. <laughs> whirlwind. Or and Leon like Kilat. a tornado. Leon Pantalion Villegas is Kilat, so that's lightning. So why, why is it that they are calling themselves like that? Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I mentioned about nativistic. Um, these leaders really, they're very wise people. They're very, very, what we call us. They, they, are, they are so bound with their environment. They know the power of, you know, forces of nature. And that's why they always label themselves as, another one, Taligsik. There is another one, Kilat. There are Buhawis. There are Dalugdug. There, there are mga Dalugdug. Uh, even their nom de guerre, there is Iskungyawa. If you take a look at how they name themselves as leaders, they are really associated with what we call as forces of nature. And Leon Kilat is an exciting personality, and that I will build the connection now of Buhawi and to Kilat. Yes, ma'am. We now have a question from uh, Al Quizon. He is also the president of a tour guides organization. So how do we classify the revolt initiated by Juan Diong of San Fernando, Cebu? Um, I'm not really familiar with that revolt, so sorry, Alha, but uh, I would rather reserve. Maybe yes. there are others who are more familiar with that. Um, uh, it's yeah, it's probably Mr. in Mr. C's uh, book. So this is uh, uh, Juan Diong is mentioned in 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 this the the many stories about Juan Diong is here. So there are different versions of the story, like um, 
Juan Diong was actually uh, part of those peasants, farmers in San Fernando who were uh, disenfranchised or who got landless because of this uh, Chinese uh, merchant who, 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 who made their lands become ranch, ranches so, and pasture land. So that's why they had this revolt. Um, it is a an agrarian revolt actually and demanding from from because uh but actually there was an augustinian priest who helped them and then the santo nino figured in that story about the the there was also a miracle of the santo nino in another version of the story so and then uh, michael colonnane dr michael colonnane who also has a version of the story so please read this book uh, of Junichi C. So, <coughs> yeah, um, all right. In the prepared question, uh, it says General Pantaleon Villegas led the 1898 Cebu Revolution against the Spanish colonial rule. Elaborate how Jos Bohawi influenced Leon Kilat. Um, the book showed by Mam Givelondo, on, uh, written by Emil, a good friend, Emil Justambasti on Leon Kilat, and other biographies written about him, had a very good mention of dates. But the common denominator in all these biographies was the unknown years of Leon Kilat when he was a teenager. We only knew of this guy when he went to Manila to become a KKK and then came to Cebu to be the leader. But the first question that we should ask is, why did he, as a native of Bakong, did not lead the revolution in Negros when there were already Catipuneros in Negros. Why was it in Cebu? That's the first question. The second thing is that it is very important to see the connection. Leon Kilat's family actually moved to Tulong at the time that he was a teenager and stayed there. Tulong will now be Santa Catalina and Bayawan. Now, this shares boundaries with Shaton and Sambongita. These were the areas where Jos Buhawe had a lot of followers. And so, even the idea that Leon Kilat, as a maayong laki, can travel the islands by way of his handkerchief. In fact, in the oral traditions in Negros, another story says that he was not actually traveling with his handkerchief. He has a sigbin. And you know what's a sigbin? Are you familiar with a sigbin? It's, a, it's an animal that we have not seen, but we always put at the back of our head. Manaagay sigbin. Unsa pa na? German Shepherd, baka na, or whatever. But uh, as a young boy, I'm very afraid of sigbins. But anyway, that's it. Following the concept of Huawei, Leon Kilat already had that. In fact, he was also a magicero, right? He can do tricks. He learned this in Manila. Then when he came to Cebu, of course, Fes de Abril happened. But five days later, you know the story. And, but the, the, the stigma, and this is, I'd like to post this to all historians and maybe researchers. Maybe we should begin to ask, why was it that Leon Kilat could have led the revolutionary struggle in Negros? But what? why was it in Cebu? There must be something. Or maybe he found this to be more fertile, more robust, and the people are more engaged. Kaya kung ato siya dito, kinsa may mutuo niya. Yes, sir. That's a very good 
That's a very good comment. Nobody probably will believe him if he will start it in Negros. That's the family. He is a Villegas, and Villegas are known to have lands, even now. So with that, I think uh, that's the whole elucidation from Buhawe. You now have Kilat, but the leader of the group, as I've said, Don Felipe Taiko, the first governor of Negros Oriental, himself also as the second Buhawi. And he literally led the march of the people from the southern towns to Dumaguete. Timing kayo ang mga taga Negros mo gather sa Dumaguete. They knew already that the Spaniards were away. That's why, in reality, there was no revolution. When they arrived in Dumaguete, it's already Bispiras. Because November 24 is the Bispiras. In the fiesta, they were all celebrating. It's similar to the November 5. They were just meeting on the bridge. But finally, the so the Bacolod event is earlier. And then the Negros event is November 24. And then the Cebu event is December. So we, we have to take a look at these dates because they are all correlated. The Bohol event, the Samar event, and even the Tacloban event. So uh, these are very good events. No? But uh, of course, in the celebration of the revolution, today we, we are cognizant of the fact that even if these so-called people were labeled before us, remontados, monteses, tulisanes, ban, ban, bandoleros, but they certainly contributed to the evolution of the idea of fighting for our freedom. So thank you very much. Uh, salamat, uh, Dr. Earl. So um, according also to, to, of course, to the descendants of Leon Kilat, we would, they showed us actually when we interviewed the descendants of Leon Kilat in Bakong Negros Oriental, they showed us this um, paper of the province of Negros Oriental adopting, uh, declaring Leon Kilat as their son, and also saying that when Emilio Aguinaldo already surrendered to, to when, when Emilio Aguinaldo already surrendered, Leon Kilat defied Emilio Aguinaldo's surrender and continued the revolution. So, of course, he was one of those who defied the surrender of Emilio Aguinaldo. He was one of the Katipunan generals, and he was sent to Cebu to lead the revolution in Cebu because Ce Leon Quilat also was able to work in Cebu. He was a baker, he worked in a pharmacy, and he worked in a circus. That's why he knows magic. We also invite you to read this story by the children of Cebu, si Leon Quilat o Gang Sigbin. We let the children of a few children, selected children of Cebu, retell the story of Leon Kilat according to how they see the magic of Leon Kilat. But of course, at the end of this book is the real story of Leon Kilat, the real story of the road to freedom of the Cebuanos. So, according also to the descendants of Leon Kilat, they really believe that Leon Kilat had magic. So, just according also to Dr. Earl. They believe that he had a magic heart handkerchief that if he would spread it, kung ila, iyang, iyang buk, bukharon, sana pag English ang bukharon? <laughs> I, iyang what? bukharon, if he, he would spread it, it would turn into a, 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 a magic carpet that he would ride on it. And, and, and the next time that he would spread it, kung sunod na sad ni iyang bukharon, mahimu na sad, it will turn into a sword. So, we had this video that we made that uh, in our interview with a descendant of Leon Kilat that said, when Leon Kilat told them that when you would see the star at the sea, then you would know that something is already happening in Cebu. So anyway, according also to Dr. Joe Bersales, a uh, Cebu historian, his explanation, why is it that the Karkar people uh, betrayed Leon Kilat? It was because they look down at Leon Kilat because why would this poor man 
they were the elite in Karkar. And so why would this poor man want to, to defy Spain? So, of course, we know that Leon Quilat, we know he is from ba he was born in Bakong, but according to his descendants, his grandfather was um, was married to a native of Karkar. And his 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 grandfather was a pure Spanish. He, he was uh, was a pure Spaniard, but he was already a mestizo, so he was already a third class citizen at that time. Because he was not born in Spain and he was not a pure Spaniard, so Leon Quilat was a mestizo, so he was not really part of the elite class at that time. So he he was according to his descendants, he would he magdaro siya, he would farm, and he did many jobs as a child. So it was the elite of Karkar that planned and implemented his murder. So, of course, the sacrifice of Leon Kilat was part of the of the of the of our road to our freedom today. So, because of his sacrifice and the sacrifices of the revolutionaries of 1898, that's why we won our freedom from Spain. So now we would like to have the open forum. So we would like to invite our audience on site to give your questions. Um, also, we would also like to read uh, some questions if there are more questions on online. So, wala pa questions. Uh, na question. So, Bambi says, good afternoon from uh, SDO Taguig. Uh, Ferdinand, who is on site and a uh, nephew of Dr. Earl, is asking, are there movements in Domagetti that propagate and teach about the local leaders? You only know about Leon Kilat. So yeah. are this is a challenge now to Seliman University. Um, there is what we call as localization, contextualization. The sad thing is it's in grade five. There's nothing in junior high school and mm -hmm. senior high school. That is our present step ed curriculum. History is only taught in the elementary grades. Ang ating bayan. So is it not in the general education in college? Not anymore. Not anymore? You don't have a history in junior high school. You don't have a history in senior high school. In college, you have Jose Rizal and readings in Philippine history. So is it not, can, can it be integrated in other subjects? It can be, but uh, the most appropriate, as I've said, is grade four, five. So, but how old school, is a grade four and a grade five student? Can grade he, four is can she, 11, nine, 10 year old? Nine? Nine, nine, nine year to old 11? And 10 years can, 10 year can, can he absorb this? So that's the thing. And that's why there's really a movement to really return Aralin, even just Philippine history, at least in high school. Sa high school lang. Wala na may history yun. There should be history in college also. Ang history sa college, kuan Roman, Rizal Roman o readings in Philippine history. But with a very, very diversified and broad coverage because it includes constitution and agrarian reform. So, uh, so this is very sad because I was actually telling Dr. Earl how my history teacher in college, history one teacher, influenced me in learning more about these native revolts, these revolts um, that are precursor to, I would, I, I already told him about Dr. Rodora Bukoy, my teacher in History One, who would let us read the history of the Filipino people, even the past revisited, uh, for us to, to know more about and to discuss and uh, so that before we go to class, we, we, are really, we were really required to read because we would be put in a hot seat and we need to be able to explain these revolts and even the 1896 revolution. So, and of course, history is very important for the young people to learn from our past and to guide us for the future. So, 
Other questions? Do you have questions on site? Hello, 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 Mayung Hapon. Good afternoon once again. Do we have questions here from our on-site audiences? Okay, there's a follow-up question. Earlier, he asked online, and now we will hear on-site from Ferdi. Okay. Uh, hello, good afternoon, um, Miss A and Uncle Earl. Um, um, my question is related to the anting anting or the vis the vestidora. Um, was or was there any um, documentation or any witness who can attest uh, to the power of the vestidora during the Cebuan Revolution? I mean, um, was it really an invinc uh, Was it really um, that powerful that it made the warriors or the revolutionary revol uh, revolutionary bolder when they encounter those um spanish or those um the military movements um, under the spanish government thank you for the question if you take a look at all these early revolts uh buhawi and papa issue were known to be mayong lucky and uh yes uh they have these incantations they have this anting anting in fact you have a lot of samples there but the influence of that is a spanning time i'll tell you in 1979, another group of a movement, 1979, the Salvatore movement. And they followed the same Papa Isu Buhawi's concept of Pakubul. And Pakubul is to be invincible. And to be invincible is to eat the ear of a human being, which is similar to the Ilaga Gang movement in Mindanao. I think you are familiar with the Ilaga movement. It's still the same. And the Salvatores believe that they're also invincible. So that's why the army, in their power of invincibility, when they bring their armor light, or will put kanabang kanon. I think you have seen, para sumpa, they put kanon in the barrel of their gun. That's the reason why nawala ang invincibility kay nasumpa man. Or they put panty. I think you have seen, yes, they put panties in the barrel of their gun. To sumpa, I think you're very familiar. We are very familiar, even if uh, the, we are now in this modern world, but you're very familiar with habak. You're very familiar with sumpa. Those are native, nativistic tendencies that we got. But as to the power, I really don't know because the Sol Salvatore, the Salvatore movement uh, finally was so, but ang katunapong Diyos Amahan, mas grabe itong ila kay ang, ang ilang cross, pangurus nila dili ana, ang ilang pangurus gikan diri pengon. Kay, di ba? Para kuno mo koberan. And even now, there are semblance of these movements across, not only in Negros, but across the Visayas. We still can see these are millenarian and na ganyo gabaligya o anting-anting put. And I know of a friend who is collecting relics of anting-anting. But if you if you see them as used by Buhawe and Papa Issues men, triangular, even there is a Cebu, they have Latin inscriptions. In my paper, I, ho I all have. And then we have a list of all the incantations and Latin uh, of this. And some are even a Latin person cannot understand because the oracion, supposed to be oracion, is now laced with Cebuano, Ilongo, and other words that is not anymore Latin. Purely Latin. It's not pure. It's a Latin person cannot even read it, cannot oh. understand. Can I example? Uh, antipuesta, antipuesta, that's very simple. But when you say, isi kriyam por sale hire, wala na yun ilami. Ice cream for sale here, naman na. <laughs> so <laughs> these are examples of. <laughs> Actually, the Visidora of Leon Leon Kila. So this yes. is uh, the depiction of the Visidora by our illustrator of this children's book. So this is actually from Andres Bonifacio or from the Katipunan in Manila. So they made a replica also, or they mass-reproduced the Visidora. This was brought by Leon Kila to Cebu. 
and he showed the power of this. So this is described well in the book by Emilio Simbaste. It was Gregorio Abellana, or uh, it was the Abellanas. Uh, it was it was Candido Padilla. He sh Candido Padilla was the one who who shot Leon Quilat while wearing the visidora. Leon Quilat in a meeting in Guadalupe. Leon Quilat showed actually a letter from Emilio Aguinaldo that he was sent to Cebu, but Emilio was not was was no longer there. So they may, he 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 brought with him um, a letter that that um, vouched for him to be sent by the Katipunan of Manila to to be in Cebu, and then he showed the power of all his anting anting. So he he wore his uh, this triangular cloth. So he had also an oration at his bosom, and of course he has a hostia redentora. He would um, it was like a hose that he would swallow in his, uh, in his mouth and he put in his mouth to prevent hunger. So he had all his anting anting his amulets, and he asked Candido Padilla to shoot him. So. Candido Padilla shot him, but he was not harmed. So that's why. So even the children, even the children showed this in. Uh, they 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 showed that they showed the 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 they they showed the power of Leon Quilat. So their depiction of that is this when he when he when he showed the power of his anting anting, and the children also. Described Leon Kilat when he was shot and he wore his visidora. They imagine it to be like the Avengers' heart that he would shoot up into the air when he had his. That's the imagination of the children. When he wore his visidora, he became like, who's that guy? Iron Man. Iron Man. He would shot up into the air. Yeah, but uh, all these practices were really Buhawi. All these. They were adopted by all these Katipunan. ceremonies, vestidoras, amulets, were all part of Buhawi's uh, acumen. And so, really, you can see the connection. As a teenager or, or late teens, he was already in that area. In fact, uh, there's a story that ang iyang dagon iyang nakitaan sa Valencia in a place called Hawa. And if you go to that area, it's near the area of uh, Liptong, which is also a, an, an area of interest. So as I've said, these are the connections, legacies of early revolts that catapulted, mixed with all the ingredients that will now form part of the package. Uh, remember, uh, he was also using a white horse. No, he used a white horse in his, I think, attack that was not successful. At, no, it was actually an attack at Fort San Pedro. Fort San Pedro, it yes. It was not successful, but then he was he was able to dodge the bullets and the cannonballs. So he was being hit. He was being bombarded by cannons and firearms by the Spaniards, but he was he was not harmed. Also, he just fell. His horse just fell. He fell with his horse, but he was he just dusted himself and proceeded with the attack. So that's why, even if that attack was not really successful in taking over the Fort San Pedro on April 5, 1898, still that attack made him more popular as someone who has kalaki, who has magic. And the the the, the, the kids portray that attack as something like when he was attacking, he was in a bubble. So while he was attacking Fort San Pedro, well, he, he was you. actually, he was riding the, the, for the children, the white horse was actually a sigbin. So, and then the sigbin made him invincible, formed a bubble around him. That's why he was not harmed. So, but of course, if Dr. Jobbers Bersales would, would, we would ask him, he would say, the white horse was actually a circus horse. It knows how acrobats. 
And also, Leon Kilat was an acrobat. That's why uh, you see he's a showman. And uh, even his choice of props catapulted his enigma and charisma. Take a look at the choice of props. Then you will understand. So do we have any more questions? Wala na? So we would like also to recognize the presence of the executive director of our partner in our event, the Andy Herted Center, Roxanne Doron. Thank you for coming. Thank you to Al, who is actually here on site. I thought, and Katipu, and World War II descendant of veterans. So daghang salamat for joining. And also, we would like you to know that at our Basahanan, we have those books that we mentioned. And also this book on Andres Bonifacio Bayani biographies by Xiao Chua. And this is signed by Xiao. So we have signatures from Xiao Chua in this book. Soon you will have the book by Dr. Earl. And we have these, the, the documents of the Katipunan in this book, The Light of Liberty by Jim Richardson. The original documents of the Katipunan are... The, the collections of, of, of the original documents of the Katipunan are in this book, The Light of Liberty. And Dr. Ritil Muharat also mentioned this, uh, made this as a reference in one of his books. So, uh, wala na tay question. So, wala na. Wala na. Comments, wala na. So, we would now like to ask uh, Dr. Earl Cleope to, to give his closing words in, this, uh, in these conversations about um, the magic and heroes. Yeah. Um, as we close, I'd like to just make a very, very simple concluding remarks. We've been talking about heroes. We've been talking about magic. But the important thing that I'm trying to really share with all of you is that, hey, these things happened more than 100 years ago. But the common denominator that we see is always Justice, oppression. It's always a problem of government does not was not able to solve these issues. And so why is it that these areas that became fertile breeding grounds of these movements to rise are still the areas being part of NLAC? Or LCAP, sometimes things have not changed. It seems. As I've said, the layer of the Buhawi movement will still be the same layer of the insurgency. And uh, that is something that we should also. Wh why is this so? The root causes of all this are already in place. Something has to be done. Because in 1988, another commander, Buhawi, was killed in the same spot where Buhawi, the original, was also killed. And so, it rings a bell. That's the point that I'd like to drive at. Thank you very much. Salamat, Dr. Earl. You would like to read before we uh, our conversation should end. This is from our viewer on site, uh, online, I mean, from Dana Jordi Honrales. And she says, Sobrang dami ko pong natutunan today. Thank you po sa pagbabahagi ng isang makabuluhang history sa aming mga manunood. I'm a grade 9 student na hindi mahilig sa history, pero ngayon po parang ito na po ang magiging favorite subject ko. Thank yes. you, Dr. Earl. Thank you. Mas malawak Thank you, ang kaalaman sa history, mas madami kang ma-share sa kapwa mo mag-aaral. So, daghang salamat, uh, Dana, Jordi, for your uh, awake, uh, for the awakening in the love for history. So, we we invite you to join us in our next events uh, to have fun conversations on history. So, daghang salamat to, and we continue to our panelist, our resource person, for sharing with us the, the movements in, in the Visayas that led also to the National Revolution and also that were uh, 
part of the journey that we have now, the independence from Spain. And we are celebrating today the Pasco sa Kagawasan, the 124th anniversary of the, the victory of the Cebu Revolution against Spain. So uh, it's our pleasure and our honor to have Dr. Earl Cleope uh, with us. So the, uh, we continue with our celebration with our host, Josh. All right. Hello. Once again, a big round of applause to Dr. Earl. Uh, did you, you guys learn Thank you. something new today? Okay, so yeah, and uh, later on, we, uh, we are still in the middle of our program. Uh, we have more performances and uh, something to look forward to in just a while. And then, yeah, so uh, the, the, the sharings for today is I was expecting just plain history and now we are now delving into the fantastical the mythological do you agree something like this could really work if you're a, if you're a writer if you're an artist something like this could uh, really work I, I am a, i am an artist i'm an art teacher as well and then hearing more not because i've already am familiar with the history of leon kilat hearing from uh these uh, individuals, Jos Buhawi, kisa pa to, dagan, o sa pa ganito, audience? Ha? Huh? Tablo, sa pa to? Yeah, so, a kidlat, yes, sa to. So, da, dalugdog, da pa to, di ba? So, we, there's a lot to unpack here and uh, we can learn more and then hopefully we get to read more of this uh, from uh, Doc, Doc's new book, uh, When when is would that be <laughs> so hopefully we can uh, we can read the book we can learn more because honestly speaking uh philippine history especially here Cebuano visayas is very rich with uh, very colorful very mythological very informative history now in a while we will have we'll be entertained with a presentation from the Bagong Teatro Hongkera. Do we have our? Uh, are we do we have. Are you guys ready? Okay, so we'll be entertained in a while now, uh, guys. If you want to share uh, our from our Facebook page, feel free to use the hashtag Cebu Independence uh, and hashtag Magic and Heroes. And yes, we also have a, another hashtag from Mam A, Pasco sa Kagawasan. Because, yeah, the, I think not everyone knows of this one, sir, that December is basically our local Independence Day here in Cebu. So, yes, we are celebrating that. Feel free to put the hashtag Pasco sa Kagawasan. Uh, another big round of applause to Mam A and Doc. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so while our next performers are uh, preparing, uh, we would like to inform everyone that we here at Palm Grass, the Cebu Heritage Hotel, we will be celebrating Tagbo 2023, our New Year's celebration. Okay, so hopefully you can still be here or you can watch through our Facebook live okay almost in one week uh palm grass would produce how many videos mama two three videos uh every other day and it always talks about uh cebuano visayan and filipino history. Ine, ine. okay and uh, and, uh, and wow Nico. so they're still preparing the uh the audio so yes uh speaking as an educator myself it is a bit true that uh, a bulk of our Philippine history is taught in the elementary, in the grade school level. Ako, I teach in the junior high and then as an arts teacher, ang amuang topics about the Philippines would be around grade 7. Yeah, or grade 7. And uh, for the AP teachers, Aralimpang Lipunan, um, 
most of them will be teaching economics about world history still important topics but yeah we i think we need to have an advocacy regarding teaching our very rich and colorful history okay so yeah so once again thank you doc earl uh mom a for that very very revealing and informative talk okay so let's proceed now to our performers so let's give a round of applause are you guys ready ready nata okay <laughs> Sige. so let us give a round of applause to batang kulon bagong teatro honkera a big round of applause come on Hello, hello. Hello. Hello, hi. Hello, 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 hello. 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 Like, oh. Hello. 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 na ang adlaw apay pamahaw ang batang kulon nga si islaw uway sudang baso sa sinsilyo wapay ni habong bisan piso si islaw ng tanaw sa restaurant nga customer dagag sudan Samtang si Islaw Naway kitlon Ang uban giusikan Ang gikaon Kung nang bayani Si yun kila Mali pa iba ka ha Siyang makakita Banga pamilya Sa dalang Manghita Bisang tumnaw O anunos O baha Kani ato ang mga bayani na kahiyo sa pagasa, o pagpalaya sa mga katsila pero karon ang kaaway na pero lahi na sa mga blanco mata sa mga bata na kita batang kulon, batang kulon. Islao do si Anjos na di pa kabsa di sa grade one walang yut ka iskula. Islao sa masao bang mga bata naghando monta ug hayag na ma. Hey, wala pa ko'y pamahaw, wala pa'y paniuto, pila na ni kaadlaw, kuya palihog ko o kabang. Gutom na siya't kaayo, nangayor ako kay di kumuhimog, di maayo, bisa kong sanga trabaho. Ako ng buhatan patagaan, nagkamay na hayag ako ka ugmaw, hindi man nagkabuhi, kinahala ng dawatan padayon. Di mawagtangan o paglaw, tabang sa gobeno mo, ragi na mo abot, kita na nanilingkod, bunot lalong libas. Nagpita ka nga baga, buhat agra nagdonasyon. Kung wala na ta, di balansi ang balaw. Kung limang tanahon, kinsapay walay balay, maupot pa huwaw. Wala mo ay mahibuin na niyang kalibutan. Magtabang sa istorya pewa. Batang kulon! Batang kulon! Mga pamilya sa dalang magigda Bisang tumnaw o anundos o baha Kani ato ang mga 
bayani nagkahi usa bagasa ug pagbalay sa mga katsila pero karon ang kaaway na pero lahi na sa mga blangkong mata sa mga bata matita batang pula wala pa ko pamahaw wala pa paniuto pila na ni kaadlaw kuya palihog ko tabang gutom na jud ka ay mga yura ko kay di kumuhi og di maayo bisag kung sanga trabaho ako nang baha tong bata gaala gamay nga hayag ako ba og mao na ni man tinapos tinaan na ning padayon padayon di mawag taong pa batang kulon All right, another round of applause for Mabel and Lenji. They are the our actresses from Bagong Teatro Hongkera performing Batang Kolon. Another big round of applause. All right. So now at this point, okay, so Doc is still here with us and Mom A, uh we're going to have a trivia quiz. Okay, and this quiz is for both on-site and our online viewers. And the questions will be related from the topic we had earlier. So I saw earlier that there were a few who were taking down notes or writing on their phones. So uh, yeah, good luck to all of you guys. So okay. Mom A, can we start with the question? Okay, so let's begin with our trivia question. Now, for, if the question is for the on-site, if you know the answer, feel free to uh, feel free to approach our microphone right here. For our online, uh, for those who are still watching us, hello. I hope everyone is doing great there. So, I would like you to type. Uh, as fast as you can, the answer. Okay, so how many questions do we have here? We have five, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, sorry, three questions, my mistake. So the first question will be for the on-site. The prize, yes. Don't say premium, Ani. What's the prize? The prize is Hilot Satiil. Okay, foot massage. Okay, huh? From the Alima native massage. I don't know kung kinsay. And palm grass. Of palm grass, rather. So uh, that will be the prize if you get this question correctly. So on site, people, get ready. And to confirm if the answer is right, Doc and Mom A will just say yes or thumbs up. Okay, so let's begin. The first question is. Name the leader of a revolt in Negros that influenced General Leon Kilat. Five. If you know the answer, approach the microphone. Five. Four. Three. Two. Okay. Ma'am, introduce yourself first. Good afternoon. I'm Lizelle. Hello, Ma'am Lizelle. And what is your answer to the question? I just I heard a while it, it's right or wrong. It, is it Buhawi? Is it Buhawi? Okay. That I am not so keen on hearing. I just heard Buhawi. So. Buhawi. Do we accept the answer? Okay. Congratulations, ma'am. It's actually, the complete answer is actually Dios Buhawi. But Buhawi is acceptable. Congratulations. Okay. And you get Hilot sa Tiel. Okay. Bragnindot na siya na premier, especially that we are a bit stressed with our work lately. Especially, if, oh, by the way, we have here in our guest the Cebu Association of Tour Guides. Hello, give yourselves a big round of applause and thank you for being here as well. Kumusta naman ang atuang uh, tour guide industry? Are we returning na? Daghan na ba? Very busy. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I'm seeing a lot of foreigners in the malls. Are, I. I I think there are some of your clients or customers. So busy na yun din tao. So we are very blessed na. Samot na ron, hapit ng sinulog. Yeah, so kana siya. This time, okay, now, for those who are watching online, this question is for you. So Mom A is currently monitoring the uh, the comment section of our FB Live. 
So, hi guys. Okay, so the question is, again, this is for our online uh, viewers. What was the date of Cebu independence from Spain? Again, the question is, what was the date of Cebu independence from Spain? I'll give a countdown. Ten, nine. Online, huh? Eight, seven, <laughs> six, five, four, three. Na na mam eight, two, one. Do we have? I'll, I'll try to see myself if na na ba. Okay, again, the question is, what was the date of Cebu independence from Spain? Let's check. Okay, online. Tanaw na to. Okay. So, nanay ni answer di rin. Duha ka buok. Okay, nanay nag-answer di rin. Okay, so we have here December 20. Nine and it's it's false. It's wrong. Okay, clue. Medyo dool dool lang og date. It's a bit near. Okay, again online ha online online. <laughs> okay, somebody answered, Mom A. <laughs> Somebody answered. <laughs> okay. 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 Mom A confirms, sir. Okay. So, congratulations to our online viewer, Jed Nicole Alerta. The answer is December 24, 1898. That was the independence. Ang nahitabo sa December 29 was the Thanksgiving. So, pag humanog, babay, nagpamisa, pasalamat, basically. So, so mauna siya. Sorry, na simplify na ko ang history. So, mauna, so, mauna siya. Okay, now, kani, the next question will be for both, online or on-site. So, we're going to give chance for this. Ah, by the way, the, uh, the prize for the second question is Hilot sa ulo ug likod. So that's uh, head and back massage. Uh, nasuya ko gamay sa premio kay medyo sakit pod akong likod recently. Pwede ihatag ni. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Pwede ipasa. <laughs> okay, so thank you. Nanay <laughs> tiil no Okay, so now for the Next question, the third question. This will serve as our last question. And this will be for both on-site and online. The prize will be the Hulum Kawa. That was, uh, kwan? Usay, in, usay closest English translation in Hulum Kawa. Kwan? Sauna? Kawa bath. Okay, so, Kawa bath. Marag pina jacuzzi. Yeah. Um, jacuzzi you know, style. Okay, and then mga flowers, flowers, diba? Okay, na, na onions. Gikuan day. Gikuan day. Gisabaw day. So, gisubak day. Okay, so, what, okay, so the third question is, kani, what was the date of the Thanksgiving Mass for the victory of the 1898 Cebu Revolution. Three, two, one. Let's start with the on-site. Okay, let's start. So, comment section. Comment section. Let's check. So, dapat new, ha? Huh? New. <laughs> Mom A, can you confirm? Ferdinand. So, <laughs> Shareholder. <laughs> Ah, sige. Um, so, confirmation, this will be for... Okay, let's start for the on-site, sir. Now, you approached the mic earlier. Can you introduce yourself and then uh, in, uh, say the answer? Uh, 
Uh, may hapon, William Villacorta. Okay. Uh, uh, Sir Jos, eh, mo naman gimension ganiha, nakapaminaw naman ko. Okay oh. rato? So, sige, okay lang. That was December 29, 1898. Yes. Because of the celebration at the uh, Cebu Metropolitan Cathedral. Yes. Kana. Actually, I mentioned that very early sa program on ya ganina. Oto pagpasat, pagtanaw na ko sa question, awa na sayun ra. Okay, ma'am A. Okay, so congratulations, sir. You get holong sa kawa. Enjoy your winnings, your reward. Let us give everyone a big round of applause. Thank you for joining our trivia questions. Uh, are you guys having fun? Nalingaw ra mo? How about our online viewers? Are you guys having fun? Feel free to uh, leave a comment, share our video, continue to share our videos. I know there's a lot of history advocates uh, in Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao, so feel free to share it among your friends. We have a lot of educators watching us today, so fellow teachers, you can share this to your respective GCs or group pages or your fellow faculty. Okay, so Manasha, so uh, before we uh, end our program for uh, today, because we are reaching our end, we will be promoting some upcoming events. Okay, so this January 21, 2020, oh, sorry, January 12, my mistake, January 12. Okay, we will have a Santo Nino versus Mga Diwata. Oh, another fantastical topic na po. And retracing our Sinulog roots. So we're familiar already with the basic history of our Sinulog, Piesta Senor. Let's dive deeper this time. Let's find meaning in its history. And of course, joining us for that talk on January 12 will be Dr. George Emmanuel. Uh, George Emmanuel Borinaga from USC from University of San Carlos. He's a Visayas historian. Okay. And also joining us on that date on January 12 is Dato Amay Yi Iwag Linsahay from Mount Palaupau, Kulaman, Ancestral Domain, Bukidnon. So we will be uh, joined by an actual Dato. Okay. And... Um, before we end our program, I would just like to thank everyone here. Give yourselves a big round of applause to our on-site guests. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, probably later we can have a group photo here in front, if it's okay, Mami. Eh? Let's have a group photo with all of you guys here. Okay, because it's a bit rare to see everyone here. Namapuno ato ang table. So we're very happy that you are here with us, joining us. And I do hope you have learned something. Okay, and of course, everyone from the working committee to our guests, to our performers earlier. And we would like to thank our partners as well. The University of San Carlos Center for, so for Social Research and Education. Museo Sugbo, Central Visayas Association of Museums. The Yande Heritage Center and the SOAN 2020 Incorporated. Okay, and of course, thank you to all our online viewers. Thank you for joining us here again. Again, feel free to share this one to your, to, to your friends, to your colleagues, to your workmates, to your fellow teachers, and other history advocates. Okay, so, Mame, do we still have... Okay, now this time, we will have a community singing. We'll be singing the Alerta. Katipunan. It was played earlier and uh, we'll be playing it here. So when you do share our video for today, our FB Live, don't forget to put the hashtag Cebu Independence, hashtag Magic and Heroes, and Mam A, hashtag Pasco Sakagawasan. All right, so I think we are done with this. Let's now have our community singing. Let us now sing the Alerta Katipunan. May we have okay. and uh, to lead us in our singing, we have here Jed. 
Okay, there you go. Stand while singing this one. Okay, I can tell you. All right, thank you very much, Jed, and thank you for joining us here in another FB Live exclusive event brought to us by Palm Grass, the Cebu Heritage Hotel. My name is Josh. Merry Christmas and have a blessed, happy, happy new year to everyone.